Hi, you're watching Investor Insights and I'm making this video in response to those three or so dozen emails from people that are always asking me or telling me how difficult financial and economic concepts can be and that they're, they're totally overwhelmed. Well first and foremost, let me tell you that economic or financial systems are actually very simple in nature. It's actually uninformed people who want to sound really diligent and intelligent that use big words such as economists that make everything sound complicated and thus overwhelming. Uh, just to go off on a little bit of a tangent, if you want to get your head around a very difficult concept, let me introduce you to one. Now, as a cosmologist, um, everything that has mass we call matter. Now matter possesses a, for a force called gravity. The larger the mass, the greater the gravity it exerts. So Earth exerts a greater amount of gravity on you than you exert gravity on the planet. But essentially you two are stuck together. Now when we expand that to uh, the whole solar system, the planets revolve around the Sun. The Sun exerts the greatest amount of gravity of any object within our solar system. But why don't the planets and everything else fall into the Sun? Because essentially it's a balancing act between the gravitational pull of the Sun and the centripetal force of those planets spinning around it. The closer the planet to the Sun, the faster it must rotate around it so as to not get sucked in. So therefore a Mercurian year is only 88 days whereas a Neptunian year is about 165 years. Now this concept is still very simple but then let's move slightly away from that and, and look at galaxies. Now, galaxies are just like our solar system only on a grander scale. So when you look at spiral galaxies such as the Milky Way you have a supermassive black hole in the middle which is the center of all gravity within that galactic system and that supermassive black hole exerts all the gravity and pulls all the planets uh, sorry, all the stars towards it and it is the stars spinning motion around the black hole that prevents them from falling in so if you extrapolate the theory behind our solar system to a galactic system the stars that are spinning closest to the black hole should be rotating at a much faster rate than those that are around the edges of the galaxy. Well this is where cosmologists got stuck because when they look at the, the rotation rate of stars around the edges of the galaxy they found that they are spinning at the same rate if not quicker than those around the center which leads to a conundrum. The, there must be a lot more mass within the galaxy and therefore within the universe than we know about because something is making those uh, stars spin at the same rate on the radius on the outside uh, outer edges of galaxies than the ones in the middle and that led to the theorem of dark matter and this is the difficult concept it turns out that more than 99% of all the mass in the universe is something called dark matter. You cannot see it because light just goes straight through it and you probably cannot touch it. It is supposed to be all around us but as I said we can't feel it and yet it comprises comprises 99% of all the mass uh, of the galaxies and, and thus the universe. And I believe that the scientists that can essentially discover it and explain it will be deemed to be a, a worthy winner of the Nobel Prize. Not these idiotic Keynesian economists who just always push for stimulus. So dark matter is a very difficult concept. I'm sorry if that took a while. Dark matter is one of the most difficult concepts to explain and prove because essentially it's all theoretical. Now let's get back to financial systems and economic systems. There is essentially one law in economics 
that one has to look at to really look beneath the surface and understand how things work and that is simply the law of supply and demand and simply stated uh, if you have um, if demand is unchanged and supply goes up prices come down if demand is unchanged and supply goes down then prices um, sorry hang on if demand is unchanged and supply goes up prices come down sorry if demand is unchanged and supply goes down prices actually go up if demand goes up and supply is unchanged then prices goes up and if demand is unchanged uh, is goes down and supply is unchanged then prices come down very very simple um, theory and it's a very very simple concept to understand and everything revolves around it whether it be the price of money or the price of goods and services the price of anything that's out there is simply dictated by supply and demand so even if you trade currencies or commodities or indices everything comes down to the law of supply and demand so if you get your head around that concept it's not too hard to understand the financial systems if you can understand as I said the, the concept of supply and demand but furthermore one should understand the um, uh, simple concepts of cause and effect so if one does something or one acts in one way an effect is going to come as a result right. so if you were to hit a nail with a hammer the nail is going to get embedded into the timber or whatever surface that you're nailing it into if you if you push somebody that person's going to fall down so there's a lot there's a lot of cause and effect and within financial systems it's the same thing if central bankers decide to print a crap lot of money and everything else stays the same it would the 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 cause the printing of money is going to lead to a devaluation of that money in itself that's a very simple um, concept to understand but yet the economists and the central bankers and all those idiot lemmings investors or traders out there who are trying to trade against the the actual concept uh, may win out at first because the central bankers may try and stifle the effects of the action that they've taken but essentially the free market will catch up when other factors come in into the uh, the, uh, the um, equation and everything gets back into balance so it doesn't matter how much uh, the Fed wants to lie about there being no inflation because first things first the definition of inflation is an expansion of the money supply first um, myth uh, um, totally unfounded so to say that there's no inflation but yet you've quadrupled the money supply is an absolute lie in itself now if we take a more layman's view of what inflation is and that being interpreted interpreted as the rise in prices of goods and services well through the use of uh, statistical manipulation and selective withdrawals of items that have gone up too much the Fed and other government officers can lie about the rate of inflation but essentially if you print money and that money uh, is now in such great supply chasing a finite amount of goods and services then you know that there must be rise in prices of those goods and services because you've got so much more dollars chasing all those finite amount of goods and services it's enough for me. so whenever you hear about uh, the lack of inflation or even scarily deflation which is actually what the free market wants but uh, unfortunately because of the amount of debt that the that the US and other large Western um, democratic 
countries have lined themselves with over the past decade or two decades, especially the US in the past five years, um, there is nothing else that they can say except that um, they need more inflation and that deflation is going to lead to a destruction of the financial system. They have to say this because as the debt gets bigger and bigger, the only way to get rid of it is to um, have an inflationary default in that if you print enough money to make that money uh, um, meaningless, the numbers become meaningless within the currency, then all that debt, that 17 odd trillion dollars as it stands today, will become meaningless. And if you don't believe that something like that can happen, um, I've always loved this, but the Zimbabwe currency, 100 trillion dollars. That's the extent that you can print money until it has no more meaning. That's one followed by 14 zeros. And yet, this note could not even buy you a square of used toilet paper. It essentially is not um, currency anymore, and nor does it deserve to be. But America is fast heading down that track. And it's not without any sort of um, uh, discretion that the Fed and policymakers are saying that they're actually not doing that. And in fact, you can see a lot of actions, um, especially coming up in the, the following discussions over the Fed and the policymakers, uh, that they try, they put a positive spin on their actions. And in fact, they artificially create situations where the rest of the world believe that they're doing the right thing, and yet everything continue, continues unabated. And the total uh, elimination of their debt through inflation is high on their cards. But essentially, nothing will change. And it doesn't matter if the Fed tries to artificially manipulate the markets, whether it be the bond market or the stock market or the housing market, through the uh, manipulation of interest rates, both through uh, lowering the Fed's funds rate down to almost zero and through asset purchases um, of both mortgage-backed assets and their own treasuries just to keep rates low. But essentially, that's the two, two tools that the Federal Reserve has in its tool bag to try and help uh, revive this zombie economies of theirs. So uh, even when you look at supply and demand, interest rates are simply the um, supply, the rate of supply and demand of money. So a very, very simple concept of interest rates is that when there is a high demand for money, uh, through the banks or through loans, interest rates have to go up. When there is lower demand, then interest rates just come down. A very, very simple concept. And by the Fed artificially clamping down on uh, interest rates, it sends out false signals to the economy that, well, there is low demand for money, so therefore you should borrow as much as you can and take advantage of it. But essentially, the consumer is tapped out and companies are issuing debt at a record pace to take advantage of these unbelievable uh, interest rates. And suckers who believe that the economy is recovering and yet interest rates are so low are in for a big shock when the free market returns and the Fed is totally unable to do anything about the consequences of that happening. So essentially, you can clamp down on bond yields by purchasing assets, but that's, a, that's on a diminishing return because as your balance sheet grows and as the amount of debt grows, you have to purchase more and more and more bonds just to keep the rates at the same pace because the, the free market and inflation dictates that rates must go higher when you have so much demand for money. And so as a consequence, 
I believe that the Fed will never taper. This is the subject of the next video. But it cannot taper for the simple reason of uh, its own destruction, it's the destruction of its own balance sheet and the structural default of the American government as a consequence of them tapering. And I mean a proper taper, and not some bulldust 5 or 10 billion taper. So um, keep on reading, keep on getting informed, and don't get overwhelmed when you listen to uh, financial commentators, economists, or, econ or just idiots who want to sound really intelligent through the use of big words, but essentially they're all the concepts are very simple.